This right here is the KSO Show. You're home for K-State coverage. Stay current on what's happening in the Wildcat world of sports. By the end, you might want to tell your friends about us. Or not. But hey, you should. Let's get it. It's just Derek Young and Matt Hall today. A unique pod, Derek, because one, it's just us, and two, we are not going to talk about basketball at all. That's the last time I'm going to say that word in this particular podcast. It is just football, D-Y, and Matt Hall. Yes, let's do it. It's really that simple. And we're thinking before we start, we're going to go a little bit of a gimmick today. We're going to go past, present, and future. So in the first few minutes of this podcast, we'll talk about K-State's Pro Day held today in Manhattan that we were all at. Then we will discuss the fact that spring football starts Depending on when you're listening to this, today, you know, Wednesday afternoon is when spring football starts for K-State for a couple of days before they take a bit of a break. And then we'll wrap it up with Derek giving you a bit of an idea of the big picture um, of Kansas State football recruiting without going into a lot of the details he shares with you um, at K-State Online. So, DUI, we went to the pro day today. There's a ton of different ways we could we could start this. I'll start by asking you impressions of the two main guys there today Alex Barnes and Dalton Reisner both had good NFL combines great you know by probably for Alex Barnes depending on how you look at it neither chose to test today from a you know 40 bench that kind of stuff which to me seems smart and just did positional drills so that's my question to start to you is one do you agree with those two guys choosing to not uh try to improve upon their numbers or to uh test again and then two just how do you how did you get the sense the days for those two players in particular went yeah, I think that it was the right decision, probably the only decision pretty pretty easy one to make because they've already put up really, you know, solid two great testing numbers and um though you can always improve on it, once you get a good one they usually tell you to you know, kinda hit the shelf and that's clearly what these two did. Uh from so they did only positional drills from that standpoint. I thought that and it's not a bad thing that Alex Barnes was probably better at the NFL Combine mm-hmm. than he was today. The, uh, he's still good today, but he, uh, he, I think he really hit a stride at the NFL Combine and probably uh, you know knocked everything he did out of the park on that particular day. Which if you're going to pick one day to do it, that's that's the one to do it. Uh, Reisner I thought was uh, just consistent as always. Yeah. Uh, he's he was pretty much the same as he was at the NFL Combine, which was the same as he you know he showed through. F- you know, four years at Kansas State, so you, you just always know what you're going to get from Dalton Reisner, it seems like, and that's probably what might, you know, boost his value the most is there's no surprises when it comes to him. No doubt. Something I thought that was impressive about Dalton Reisner today, and this is not a surprise either, but he, in a lot of ways, led, you know, today's proceedings. You could tell that the, the you know, K-State strength coaches, the K-State coaches involved, the NFL staff that was heavily involved, you know, from all the different franchises that were there, worked through him. You know, they would talk to Dalton to say, okay, get the kids ready for this or talk to Dalton. So I thought that was interesting. And then Barnes, you're right. I, I thought he was more than fine today, uh, had a good day, but I thought the combine was better. Interesting on that, we were kind of joking around with him and walking from – uh, veneer uh, into the old uh, practice complex and we asked him it was like hey out of curiosity what is your your personal best for reps 225 and he said well it was 30 going into the combine so we got four more you know in front of the crowd you talked about having a big day at the combine uh, if you're giving me a silver linings thing Alex Barnes apparently loves the spotlight because you put him in the most stressful day that you could have you know for a, a job interview NFL combine thing and he had his best physical training day ever yeah, and I want to now bench in front of a crowd because right. apparently it adds four it more adds reps. It adds at least four reps. I mean, and, and if it works for Alex Barnes, it would have to work for you. A number of other players today. I, I'm almost shy to list them all because I think I will forget some, but I'm going to try. You can help me. Duke Shelley, Eli Walker, Abdul Beecham, uh, Osvelt, Osvelt Joseph, um, um, Kendall Adams, Kendall Adams, Dalton Harmon, David Tulis, both listed. I don't know if they both worked out today, but they were both listed. Did I forget anybody? I feel really bad if I did. Do not think so. Did we say Justin Selman? Did I say Selman? You did not. Okay, well, Selman, and I, I didn't mean to forget him because I thought uh, out of all the guys, other than the two main ones, well, I mean, Duke, I thought, I guess what point is we'll start on Selman. I thought Selman was a guy who had a nice little day. I'm not saying he's going to get on a roster, but I I know the Chargers guy talked to him at the end of the, you know, at the end of the session, and I thought he had a decent little day. Yeah, he surprised us with his measurables. Right. Um, the, he did a 35-inch vert. He did 21 on the bench. Wisely took his shirt off for yeah. all of his drills. And and he looks more like a physical specimen than we were anticipating. Right, absolutely. Duke Shelley, 
is maybe the most interesting guy to follow from this. Of course, Reisner and Barnes are going to be the two highest picks. Reisner seems almost sure to go in the first round. Barnes now told us that he's here in possibly a day two selection. But I think maybe the more, not more fascinating, but a fascinating story is Duke Shelley, who was having such a good year before he got hurt for K-State. Yeah, I'm not sure I would you know, jump completely jump the shark here and say that he's going to get drafted, but he certainly impressed uh you know almost everyone today right. because at the end of the, the end of the uh once per day it ended you know the Bengals took in Alex Barnes and I think they also took in Dalton Reisner right the, the Bengals were a pretty shout focal, out Jeff Martin yeah yep. pretty pretty focal point for today's combo is the Cincinnati Bengals in, in all honesty but as that was going on everyone wanted to talk to Duke Shelley and it's probably because there was probably more to learn about him but he Apparently, and we saw some of it, obviously, we were there, the, intrigued everyone enough through his testing and through his positional drills and everything that made them want to know more about them. And that's why he had upwards of 14, 15 NFL scouts, you know, gathered around him after after the event had ended. And it was probably for a good 30 to 45 minutes, too. It wasn't just, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there. So uh, it doesn't mean that anything's going to come of it. It might be typical practice. This is really the only pro day at Kansas State we've been to, so we can't really compare, right. compare it to another another scenario. But at the end of it, it seemed like Duke Shelley had done enough to warrant at least a little bit of inter- intrigue and curiosity from scouts. I think so. If I correct me if I'm wrong, I think the lowest time I saw listed for him might even be today was a 4-4-2, which is a very good time, of course. And it's also impressive considering, I think he said after, he really only started getting back into work physically about a month ago. One more guy I want to talk about from the pro day today, and if there's more you want to bring up, absolutely do it, but it would be Eli Walker, a guy who I think impressed at least a few scouts there today for sure. I know he got a little bit of buzz, and I think he was the guy most off the radar who now I say, oh, man, there's a chance he could have a chance at getting on an NFL roster, at least as an undrafted free agent in training camp somewhere, because I think he did some nice things today. Yeah, there's a prob- it's probably guaranteed he's not going to get drafted. I would right. go, go beyond that. But at the same time, there's there was a few NFL scouts that if you know you kind of picked their brain to see what they were kind of thinking or what they – you know, had heard or, or projecting, they, they say he has an outside shot of making an NFL roster at some point in his career, that he has that kind of potential. And it's more or less maybe he wouldn't five, ten years ago, but the, the way the spread offenses are now, his kind of body type and his kind of measurables intrigues defenses because that's kind of the type of, you know, player, prospect, whatever you want to call him, that you want to throw out against these spread offenses. And we – You'll see it on the videos Flanders puts up if he hasn't already. I asked him what's something that he didn't get to show at K-State that he feels confident about, and it was in the vein of what you're talking about. He had some scouts tell him they believe he can cover field very quickly and can be a ball hawk type safety who can cover the pass when he knows that his perception from K-State fans is only as a big hitter who can't cover the pass. He said that almost word for word. And he, he doesn't believe that's who he is. He thinks he didn't get to show that at K-State. And he at least to, his, to hear him say it, some scouts have told him the same. Yeah, he, I think he's starting to you know get a pretty good sense of optimism around his own NFL draft prospects. And we kind of see that, too. There's definitely more to him than just being a hitter because I think we were all kind of, I wouldn't say taken aback, but a little bit surprised because we don't get to see Eli Walker without pads very often. We saw him today without pads. Right. Much leaner than you'd think. Absolutely. I thought he was... A lot of guys were interesting. I thought Duke Shelley was a hair less muscular than I'd seen in the past, which isn't all a bad thing. He ran well. And also, too, like we said, he hasn't been able to really work out fully for a long time. I thought Eli Walker looked a little bit leaner. Justin Silman, who we know you know, is put together, but to see him today, he is physically different than I, than I even knew. And then Alex Barnes, we've always, we've always seen it, but another guy really put together. Yeah, Barnes, I think, is in better shape, shape now than I think I've ever seen him. Absolutely. So that kind of shows you the kind of development and, and at least improvement or emphasis that he's had since, you know, the season ended. And with Justin Silman, boy, I mean, he almost looks like he probably is going to be in the WWE at some point in his life. Maybe so. Maybe that's what his calling is at some point. I do want to say a quick thanks. I'm sure they're listening to Ryan Lackey and Kenny Lanou and K-State, not just from us, but from all, you know, all the media. They made this very easy for us today, and that's really, really great to see. I want to transition into talking about spring football. I think the best way to do it, and D.Y., you were talking to a lot of people, so I'm not sure if you were around for all these conversations, um, but I asked – Eli Walker, Abdul Beecham, and Duke Shelley. And again, Flanders will have it all up if he hasn't already. I know at least one's on his Twitter right now. About their pers- uh, what they're hearing from the younger players in the program about Chris Kleiman and that stuff. And of course, we expect they're going to say, oh, it's going great, they're happy. But like Duke Shelley, for example, I mean, his face lit up talking about it. As K-State Spring Football does open up today, if you ask guys like Shelley, like Walker, like Beecham, anybody there, 
what the perception is. They will tell you what you think you're going to hear is that the players are thrilled with what's happening. It'll be fascinating to see now that they start practicing some football today, you know, does that keep up or does it become more like a coach player relationship? Yeah, it's certainly a player's program right now. I don't think that's going to change, but I, I mean, some, some of the, you know, goodness, the glamour, the, the funness is going to go away. You're going to start getting screened out a right. little bit today. Absolutely. That's the thing. And I, and I think these kids have played football. They know that's going to happen. They understand that it's not all going to be handshakes and, and high fives and hugs. But I, I still think they know they're going to be treated in a way that's a little bit different in the past. And the excitement is very genuine. So spring football is an exciting time, of course. We're going to have Chris Kleiman and assistant coaches. I'm going to get a lot of this wrong. But on Friday, I know then K-State has spring break next week. So there's really nothing as far as all media availability that week. But then after that, DUI seems like multiple times a week. We'll have a couple practices at least we're able to go to as fans listening to this. And not just from us. I mean, hopefully we can provide everything you need. But from all sorts of media outlets, you're going to see so many opportunities over the next you know month to learn about K-State during spring football. Yeah, I think we're going to get you know the first half of – two separate practices that it'll be open to the media for observation. And that's not even including what they're, well, I think, but they call the spring football showcase yeah. instead of a spring game. So we'll spring have, showcase. Yeah. I so, think, yeah. Yeah. So we'll have three opportunities to, to watch them practice. If you include that, um, I think we get uh, a separate press conference with each of the coordinators mm-hmm. at some point during spring football. Uh, they'll also be available uh, two two other times, I, I I believe, and then assistant coaches three or four times, climbing three or four times. I think players, you know, after spring break, it'll be two times a week that we'll get players, I believe. So much more uh, availability. It doesn't mean it's going to be better or worse, but I mean, there's going to be plenty of opportunities for you, for you, you know, those listening to kind of see behind the curtain a little bit more than they typically would have. And you'll probably get a little bit. You might even get a little bit burnt out because there's. It, I, I love. Right. I, I love. I love the coverage. I love the opportunity to for these availabilities. But I mean, I feel like there's only so much you can, kind of, you know, discuss about spring football. At some point, yeah, I do feel I'll run out of questions. One, a lack of intelligence on my part. But then two, uh, and again, give us availability every day, and we're going to be there, and we're going to do our best. But yeah, I'll probably run out at some point. All that said. If there was ever going to be a spring where we have a lot of access, this is a great one because for the first time in an awful long time, we don't know what we're going to see in spring football. We don't know what's – I mean, we, we understand what the schemes are going to run are, but we don't know them to the detail we understood what Bill Snyder and K-State was going to do before. So there's a million things to watch for this spring that are going to be fascinating, and I'm not going to put you on the spot and ask you for one, so I'm going to ask you about a few. To me, it's the fact that – and you've talked about this on the site, is we're going to see position battles start. They won't be ended in the spring by any stretch, but start in the spring that you never would have thought there were before. I mean, it, when under Bill Snyder teams, you could pretty much project, even if starters were lost, who was going to come behind them and replace them. Now, other than, like, I think, I think you wrote off an, an OTR, if I could slow down and speak, that other than quarterback, virtually every position is up, is up for grabs. Uh, yeah, that's the message they certainly sent to the entire roster, and they've the players usually you typically hear that every year, right? The coaches say, well, you know, you got to earn your spot every year. Uh, but they've got the message, and I think they're kind of realizing it and even understanding it and embraced it, that it's that it's a fact that the only spot that's really been locked down is Skylar Thompson, your starting quarterback. Other than that, everything is up for grabs, and I think that they feel like it's a genuine message that they're being delivered that from the coaches. So I think you're going to see guys – I wouldn't say overextend themselves, but they're definitely going to have that in the back of their minds because I think, uh, you know, anybody could play. I mean, right. it's not just because there's, you know, plenty of spots open. Technically, there really isn't. Right. But I think they feel like it is. Now, don't get me wrong. I You'll find fewer, bigger Skylar Thompson believers and supporters than me. I think he, I mean, I'm not saying he shouldn't be the starting quarterback. He absolutely should. But surprising is the wrong word because it's not surprising, but how telling is it that they, that they did go out of their way to say, but that guy is the starter at that position because it's such an important position to have a leader. I think it is a little bit interesting. They, a guy they haven't coached yet that they said, that's your starter. How important is it to have one guy leading the program from quarterback starting in spring football? Yeah. It's in the eye of the beholder. This staff clearly thinks it's right. The, one of the most important things in their entire program to have one voice, one, one quarterback. And it's a, uh, you know, a big departure from what we're typically used to. I think Bill Snyder kind of thought that, you know, having a little controversy or a little, you know, a debate a quarterback might have been a good thing, that it could push the other one to get better and then that the cream would rise to the top, right? That's what uh, – and Bill Snyder's not the only coach that thinks that way, but this is a different staff that feels like 
they get more benefit out of knowing who the quarterback is. I'm just going to ask this on the air and expose my stupidity. Jaron Lewis is here for the spring. Yes. Is that correct? Right. So that's going to be another fascinating battle to watch. We know Skylar Thompson's a starter. It'd be easy to assume, oh, John Holcomb will be the backup or even Sammy Wheeler because of their experience at K-State. That kind of falls out the win- goes out the window because they don't have any experience in the system. And for everything you've heard and we've been told, like that will be a real battle for that backup quarterback spot. That's not going to be handed to John Holcomb. For yeah, example. that's probably one of the biggest mysteries going into spring football. I don't know if it'll be decided over spring football. Like we said, there'll be the battles will take place in the spring football. It probably won't end them, but I wonder how quickly they want to establish a number two starter so that you know he can go and begin fall camp as knowing that he's going to get those number two reps and if they how much value they place on knowing QB two as much as they do QB one. That'll be interesting to see. But I think it is wide open, and I think that they do want you know quite a bit of competition for that spot. And not only you know as they're no real experience for many of them that are going to be battling for it, but only one of them was handpicked by this current staff. Just realized we're almost 16 minutes in. I have not mentioned the Tallgrass Tap House. I apologize profusely to them. Uh, Tallgrass Tap House will be there Thursday night. DY won't be there. We've kept him in Manhattan for a long time. He's going to go home for one day and then come back on Friday because you will have Chris Kleiman available and the assistant coaches this Friday morning. We'll have a lot of people at Tallgrass tomorrow, though. I've got a lot of texts, a lot of exciting people are going to come watch. If you're listening to this, we'd love to have you come out. There'll be some posters on the board who are somewhat famous that that you can see. And this is our last one of the year, you know, at Tallgrass Tap House. This is the regular end of the regular season for that sport that I was going to go one podcast without mentioning um, that's going so well right now. But we will be there Thursday night, 8 o'clock. Uh, come say hi and hang out with us. Uh, being the last one of the regular season, I imagine we might hang out a little bit after even. Who knows? Um, but thank you to them. Also, thank you to Harry's and Bourbon Baker. They continue and have been great to us. So thank you so much to them. Back to it, D.Y. Before we get out of spring football, we're going to have so much to talk about from that starting on Friday. A big piece of football news today that you were fortunate enough to get and break for us on the site. That's now on Twitter and it's free, so you can talk about it on here. K-State gets, you know, not a new player, but a little more time from a key player on their roster. Yeah, Elijah Sullivan basically gets a do-over for his junior season. This past year was run it back. Yep, this past year was supposed to be his junior season. He played three games, started one. I think the last game he played was actually a pretty good performance from him. It was against West Virginia on the road in Morgantown, yep. and uh, he never played again. But he'll get a medical waiver, which means he will be returning uh, for two more years again, just like he was this this past year. So it's like this past year never happened. So two more years from Elijah Sullivan. Uh, I anticipate him being a starter alongside Daquan Patton and Justin Hughes at linebacker. Uh, he might even have a leg up on Daquan Patton. We'll see. The, uh, the 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 benefit that Patton has is that he's healthy. We'll go through spring football. I don't believe Elijah Sullivan will. I think he is still recovering from injury, and I'd be surprised if he was a full participant for spring football, if at all. Um, he had a couple surgeries, I believe, so he's not necessarily the most healthy player, but Patton and Hughes are. I don't know if that will – you know how much that'll weigh into what happens you know when fall camp comes around but it is good to have Sullivan a uh, really good player you could make an argument that he was this, their best linebacker before he got injured so it's key to have them for two more years as it also helps a little bit with the class distribution they only had I think they had one junior linebacker and four seniors so this right. kind of gives you two juniors and three seniors that's something you noticed I remember when KSO started and we started having conversations about it one of the first things you noticed was linebacker roster imbalance and yeah it's just one guy that's just one year but every bit helps particularly when it's from a player who could be a starter you mentioned Daquan Patton and I'm not trying to go back into the pro day but I'm trying to remember there were a number probably 15 to 20 current Wildcats you know when I say current not graduated yet at pro day not participating but you know watching Skyler Thompson AJ Parker Mike McCoy of course is retired but still part of the program in, in a manner he was there um A.J. Parker, Kevion McGee, Daquan Patton. I don't know if I already said that. But they were, they were a number of Wildcats there today. You mentioned the roster balance, so what it does, I think I should have just stuck with that point because that was a more natural segue of our last segment here, which is talking a little bit about football recruiting. K-State has had, have they had two junior days now? Yep. At this point, so two junior days. They're going to, of course, use spring football to be a recruiting tool for them, which as you've taught us has been what they've built things around. I say this every time we have you on the show, I don't want you to go feel like you have to give away all the information you share on our site. If you don't subscribe to KSO, we'd love to have your business. Come check us out. Maybe wait until after K-State wins the big 12. That's a wink at, you know, a possible promo or something like that. But DY just in general, you know, since the last time we've had recruiting talk, it's been a little while. 
How are things going? I know a lot of people are looking at these Kansas kids, of course, the Corcorans, the Kai Thomases, Hardens, Malik Berry, that kind of stuff. What's the latest maybe on that group and just where K-State stands as we get closer to probably landing at some point the first commit of the class of 2020? I wouldn't say they're getting a little impatient uh, for a commit, but that's certainly something that's in the back of their minds, and they'd certainly like one sooner rather than later, uh, but I don't know if they're panicking. I don't think that they are. Their first commit last year came in on April 2nd from Cooper Beebe, so uh, not even behind schedule by right. those turns, but they'd certainly like to have one in the uh, a commit in the column before then and we'll see if they can get there i think malik berry is probably the most likely and uh, even, even him and none of these kansas players or at least none of them are going to come out and say they all seem pretty you know interested in waiting until the summer until making a college choice which is going to make it maybe a, a little stressful for right. kansas state not only the fans but the coaches if they all choose to wait until the summer because that's when the clock starts to narrow a little bit but i would be surprised if no one came off the board before then though and i think if you're looking you know at the the most likely culprits i used to think that it was kai thomas i think he'll probably will wait until the summer yeah i think ku is probably giving uh, i don't think ku is going to land him i still tend to think Kansas State will, but KU is going to give make Kansas State work for it. It's kind of the way I've been describing that, and I think that's a good way of describing it. But Malik Berry is probably the most likely out of that group, and if I had to go number two on most likely before the summer, I would say maybe Hayden Pauls or Nate Matlack. Kind of a broader topic and something that following your updates and reading the recruiting updates you write and the notebook you write, uh, sometimes multiple times a week, uh, that I've been surprised by is when we heard Chris Kleiman talk and and everyone talk was all the talk about dominating the state of Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri, that kind of stuff, St. Louis. And they, they're working on that. That was absolutely true. They're clearly doing that. But I've been surprised at how many offers I've seen to kids from areas that typically K-State doesn't recruit very hard. You know, the, you know, the Michigans, the Californias, that kind of stuff. Has that surprised you at all, how wide of a net they have spread while still trying, you know, to work the Kansas City area and Kansas and Missouri so hard? Yeah, yeah, it's been pretty surprising. Is Peter distracting you? Our yeah. dog's over here right now. Like, just will not let Dy stop petting him. It's not going to happen. It's. Uh, I would say it's pretty surprising, and and, I'm, uh, and, I, and I don't want to be critical, but I'm not sure some of it's not in a good way. Uh, I, I worry about how you know why you spread yourself if it ever at some point becomes a little too thin, especially in California. I'm not saying don't recruit California, but I mean. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I would say, you know, we're getting close to where 15, 20% of the offers from Kansas State might be from the state of California. And right. Maybe that's a little bit of an over exaggeration. It might be. And maybe that'll work out. I mean, they took Kenyon Reed from UCLA. So maybe they're just good enough recruiters where that's not going to really make a difference one way or the other. But it just seems like an interesting state to emphasize as much as they are right now. And I, w I want to. And without knowing how much you know return it's going to be, I wonder how much the investment truly is at this point. I do want to wrap up recruiting just a little bit, talking about, again, the state of Kansas, which is going to be always a focus for any coach at Kansas State. But, of course, this staff, this is a uniquely talented year. You released your Kansas Top 20 on our site maybe a week or two ago. As we wrap this up, this edition of the KSO Show, of course, like I said, brought to you by Tallgrass Tap House, Bourbon and & Baker, and Harry's. Maybe throw me a kid or two on that list. Not the names everyone hears. Not Turner Corcoran. Maybe not Malik Barry. Not even Daniel Jackson. You know, not Kai Thomas. Not those kind of names. Mm -hmm. But, you know, a name or two on that list that hasn't been talked about a lot or maybe you ranked higher than the Risen Rivals did itself or other people have perceived. Uh, well, I think one would be the Topeka quarterback that's probably listed as an athlete, and that's Devonche Harden. Right. Uh, it's probably not someone I really gave enough attention to when we saw him last year a couple of times, probably because I'm only looking at him as a quarterback. Not a knock on him as a quarterback, really good athlete, but he probably projects better elsewhere. When you start to project him into some of these other positions, such as linebacker or safety, then the ceiling of potential skyrockets a lot more than it would be at quarterback. So I think he's someone – that I even had almost pushing for top five in the state right. of Kansas, which is you know, a pretty big jump, but I think it's one deserving because when you're 6'4", almost 200 pounds, and it can run like that, then you have the really you know an immense capability to play the linebacker position in college at a very high level. Now, the learning curve is going to be a little bit steeper. He's I don't think he even plays defense, so right. that would be where the challenge lies in that department. And another one, I like offensive lineman Hadley Panzer, uh, I think it's from Lake in Kansas. I'm not even sure where that is on the map. 
I don't know if you yeah, do. Uh, I wish you didn't ask me because I don't either. So now, now they know that this Kansas guy doesn't know where Lincoln is. So yeah. if you're from Lincoln, I, I apologize. I'm from Galvin. You may not know where Galvin is. So let's not get mad at each other. But go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's small small school Kansas football, and Kansas State's got plenty of you know examples of where they pulled some players from those small towns that have you know gone on to have you know exemplary careers i think jordy nelson probably fits Absolutely, in that, yeah. that category so you, hadley panzer offensive lineman he's almost in my top 10 i have him even ranked above sam shields the offensive lineman in manhattan that has a ku offer so i really think a lot of hadley panzer uh he's a really good wrestler i think he's a state contender in the heavyweight division so a little nugget there but i believe that uh He's visiting Kansas State this weekend as well. I don't think we're in the territory of him maybe challenging for an offer, at least at this point, but maybe someone to think about, you know, as one of their more sought after preferred walk ons or someone that comes in at camp over the summer when the, one of their one day camps, it just blows Kansas State away enough to where he almost, you know, you know, forces them into an offer. One more from that list I want to ask you about, then I will actually wrap this up. This is one of the names people know. You know, Nate Matlock's not a surprise. He's not an under-the-radar guy. But as reading your list and as you watched film, I think you even see him as a little bit better prospect than than some national guys do. And he's a three-star kid. He's not, again, not under the radar, but I think you see him uh, as a little bit more elite prospect than that. Yeah, he's got a lot of length to him and a lot of strength. So we're going to keep... Length and strength. We're going to keep rhyming here. Nate Matlack, uh, I love his size. I think he's tested well. I I have a pretty good relationship with his trainer that thinks a lot of him in terms of his testing numbers and measurables. Um, And he's 6'3", 6'4", maybe pushing 6'5". So he's definitely still growing. So someone where the the arrow is definitely pointed upward. And we'll we'll see. I mean, I think a lot of them, I think I put them all the way up at the number three, him and Hayden Pauls, I think, along with... uh, Turner Corcoran and Daniel Jackson, I think, are the you know four four star prospects in this class. To me, I think there's four of them. Um, it's not like that That's on a, crazy. any, any yeah. national network doesn't have that. But if I had to get you know if I was thinking you know Turner Corcoran is a fringe five star, and I have Daniel Jackson as a comfortable four star, and I would have Hayden Pauls and um, Nate Malak as you know fringe four star prospects, which shows you not only the the talent in Kansas but also the depth. So I really like him, but. You know, it's not just the national networks that haven't really picked up on it like I have, and we'll see who's right. But he doesn't have the exemplary offer list that even Kai Thomas has yet. So it'll be interesting to see if that grows or not and, you know, what ends up coming out of it. But I do think that he's someone that's potential is probably being a little overlooked so far. Another guy that K-State probably wouldn't mind not getting a great list of offers, you know, and wrapping up perhaps as soon as, as soon as they possibly could. So that is going to wrap it up for us today. I really appreciate Derek, you know, went to us. Where were we at the other day? Fort we were in Fort Worth, Texas for K-State TCU. I appreciate that. He'll be back on Saturday to watch K-State play Oklahoma and hopefully win the Big 12 championship in basketball. I said it again. We'll see you tomorrow night at Tallgrass Tap House. Come see us at 8 o'clock. That's Thursday night. We'd love to have you there in person. And if you're not, we'll, of course, put it on. So for Derek, I'm Matt. That's the end of this edition of the KSO Show. He can't talk. It's a dog. Tell your friends. <laughs>